Okay. There we go. We are now live. So, good good afternoon, everyone. Um, so excited to see you all here. Um, ready to learn about the amazing Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary and the coral in uh, the Gulf of Mexico off the Texas coast. I'm Anna Farrell Sherman. I'm a clean water associate with Environment Texas, uh, which is a statewide advocate for clean air, clean water, and open spaces. My work is generally focused on advocating for nature-based infrastructure, features like rain gardens, green roofs that help stormwater slow down and soak into the soil to prevent flooding, drought, and water pollution. Uh, but today, the water that we're going to talk about is a little bit bigger than a raindrop. Uh, we're going to go further south into the Gulf of Mexico and talk about the ocean off the Texas coast. I have always loved the ocean. Um, actually, some of my very first words I learned um, on the beach with my dad were crab and wow. <laughs> um, I've learned a couple more words at this point, uh, but I still really find the ocean awe-inspiring and beautiful. And I think that we all do. And that's part of why I was so excited for this event and to partner with uh, the Turtle Island Restoration Network, the Coastal Bend branch of the Surfrider Foundation and EarthX on this webinar today. Um, we're hoping to teach you something about the amazing ocean off the Texas coast, tell you about NOAA's proposal to triple the size of the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, and tell you more about how to protect this amazing ecosystem. We're very lucky to have GP Schmall, superintendent of the Flower Garden Banks Sanctuary himself uh, on this webinar to teach us about this very special place. But I'm not actually gonna give the official introduction. Uh, for that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Joni, who is the Gulf Program Director of the Turtle Island Restoration Network. And she runs the Gulf Coast Sea Turtle Action Center and helps protect sea turtles off our coast and is going to be introducing our speaker today. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. As Anna said, I'm Joni Steinhaus, Turtle Island Restoration Network. We're an ocean conservation organization. And in 2019, we celebrated 30 years of ocean conservation advocacy, research, and working with communities to protect the watershed in our ocean. And as Anna said, the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary is our treasure. It's about 100, 110 miles off the coast of Louisiana and Texas. And we are thrilled that we have GP Schmall with us today to do a presentation on the proposed expansion. GP has been superintendent of the sanctuary since March of 1999. And prior to that, he worked eight years in the Florida Key Sanctuary. So we want to give him plenty of time. He's gonna to talk to you about the process, the proposed expansion and give you some background information. Anna will be monitoring the chat room. So if you have any questions, please type them in. And if it's relevant to a particular slide that GP's on, we'll, we'll interrupt his presentation and ask your question. And then we'll also leave a little bit of time at the end for questions. So thank you again for everyone for being here. Thank you, GP, for being here. And we're gonna turn it over to you for your presentation. Okay, thank you, Joni. Thank you, Anna. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to do this today. Um, and I will, uh, again, my name is GP Schmall. I am the superintendent of the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, I work for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who administers the uh, National Marine Sanctuary Program. And my office is based out of Galveston, Texas. And there's a NOAA, uh, a NOAA lab in Galveston that includes both the National Marine Fisheries Service and our office of the National Marine Sanctuary Program. And so I'm going to kind of uh, jump right into it, I think, and um, turn my screen on. Um, and Anna, if you can tell me to make sure that uh, it's showing correctly, um, that would be great. Yes, you're showing correctly. Okay. So this is, um, so I'm going to talk about the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. And um, I have to say that even uh, people in uh, Texas sometimes um, are not familiar with it. It's an area that is offshore of the, uh, of the coast and far enough offshore that it is outside the range of accessibility by most people. And so for, for that reason, uh, it 
a lot of people don't know about it and many people have uh, not been out there and you'll see why in a moment. Um, the, the picture on the screen right here is taken from an area that is um, in the deeper water areas around the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. And I'll be talking a little bit about that today. I want to um, start. Okay, I thought I was gonna start. With a little bit of background, uh, as I'm not sure what the, um, what the level of knowledge of everyone on this call is with the National Marine Sanctuary Program, but um, this is a national program. We have um, 14 National Marine Sanctuaries around uh, the country in the waters of the United States and in associated territories, including American Samoa. Uh, and from this map, you can see that they're spread around throughout the uh, coastal areas of the United States, uh, including um, in the Great Lakes. There is an existing sanctuary called Thunder Bay in, the, in Lake Huron in the Great Lakes. And those sanctuaries range from Stellwagen Bank up in the northeast off of Massachusetts, down to the Florida Keys, several on the west coast from the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary up to the Olympic Coast in the state of Washington, and including uh, a couple in Hawaii, including the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary and the Papahanao Makuakea Marine National Monument. And like I mentioned, the, um, the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. So there's quite a range of uh, habitats. Uh, we like to compare ourselves in some ways to the National Park Service. These are like parks, uh, except they're underwater for the most part and, um, and uh, administered through NOAA, through the Department of Commerce rather than the Department of Interior. Um, the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary is the only National Marine Sanctuary in the Gulf of Mexico. So the National Marine Sanctuary Program um, is administered by the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. And the purpose of the, of the act is to identify and designate as National Marine Sanctuaries areas of the marine environment and Great Lakes, um, which are of special national significance. Um, but there's an important proviso it is part of our program is that we also are charged with um, facilitating to the extent compatible with the primary objective of resource protection, public and private uses. So it's a, a compatible use kind of program. And we do allow for uh, use of the sanctuary. And therefore, sometimes the, the word sanctuary connotes an idea uh, of um, total protection. Uh, that's not totally true because it is this is a multiple use program. The, um, in the, the flower garden banks is, uh, we'll zoom in on it just a little bit more. It's located, uh, as Joni said, off the coast of Texas and Louisiana. If you drew a line directly south of the Texas-Louisiana border, you would uh, run into the kind of right between the east and west flower garden bank located about 100 miles offshore. And um, the, uh, the, the sanctuary was um, uh, designated in 1992, and then uh, as the East and West Flower Garden Bank, and then in 1996, an additional feature called Stetson Bank was added to the sanctuary, it, and it's located about 70 miles off the coast of Texas. The, uh, the reason the sanctuary was, or the East and West Flower Garden Banks was uh, designated primarily was because of the incredible coral reefs that occur there. And many people aren't aware that um, uh, luxuriant coral reefs occur off the coast of Texas. Um, but the reason for this is that it's far enough offshore that it's outside of the influence of direct coastal runoff. Uh, there is not a lot of um, sedimentation and uh, pollutants that come off the coasts of, um, uh, of Texas, Louisiana, as you know, um, the Mississippi River drains about 40% of the land mass of the mainland uh, U.S. and most of that goes gets dumped into the um, in the Gulf of Mexico, creating an annual dead zone and other host of problems. But if you get far enough offshore, um, the the warm, clear waters that are brought up from the Caribbean that come up through a current that's known as the Loop Current into the Gulf of Mexico brings uh, this clear water and it allows uh, areas like this to have been become a, established. 
Uh, the coral reefs at the Flower Garden Banks are uh, surprisingly some of the healthiest coral reefs, uh, certainly in the Western Atlantic and Caribbean region. It's, uh, as you probably know, um, coral reefs are in trouble, uh, big trouble worldwide. Um, the, in the Caribbean is, is, is no less uh, than anywhere else. They've, uh, coral reefs of the Caribbean have shown declines of up to 30% or more in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, but because of the isolation, because of the unique location of the flower garden banks, the corals are at least right now maintaining their uh, level of health and uh, have, have done so since the first monitoring programs that were established in uh, the late 1980s. So again, um, the flower garden banks include the northernmost coral reefs in the continental United States, um, located about 100 miles offshore and about 56 uh, uh, square miles in size. And the water depths range from about 17 meters at the shallowest point, um, that's where the primary coral reefs are, down to about 152 meters on the surrounding areas of the banks. The, um, so it is a national sanctuary and there are regulations um, involved. Most of those regulations are designed to protect the bottom features, to protect those coral reef features and associated habitats. And most of the regulations are therefore um, directed at things that would impact the bottom. So anchoring is obviously a big one uh, and anchoring is prohibited within the National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, discharges of uh, most sorts you know, are prohibited uh, with certain exceptions. There are um, exceptions to allow for um, actually for uh, release of uh, chum and that kind of thing for permitted fishing activities, for um, uh, vessel uh, deck uh, wash down and that kind of thing. Um, taking coral or any kind of invertebrate or really any, any kind of feature really from the sanctuary is prohibited. Um, but as I mentioned, it is a, um, uh, we do allow uh, certain uses and fishing is allowed. But, uh, but only by what's known as conventional hook and line. So um, any kind of fishing that impacts the bottom, like traps, uh, trawls, uh, bottom long lines, that kind of thing is prohibited. The, um, find the, but the flower garden banks are only and Stetson Bank are only three of what are dozens of reefs and banks that occur along the edge of the continental shelf in the Gulf of Mexico. And so this is kind of color coded from shallow to deep. Starts uh, red is indicates shallower waters, while blue is deeper waters. And you can, um, as you can see, the continental shelf in this part of the Gulf of Mexico extends out from the shoreline for quite a distance, depending on where you are. Um, but then it reaches a point, um, as you can clearly see, where there's that distinct line that it breaks off from the, um, the, the red grading to yellow down to the blue into the deep part of the Gulf of Mexico. And right along the edge of that um, drop off uh, is this series of features, uh, underwater features that we call reefs and banks. And they, they range from the flower garden banks to the west all the way to the east um, to, uh, uh, to almost to the Mississippi Delta. The, um, what, so what we are talking about now with the main reason for this presentation is that we have a proposal that we would expand the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary by adding 14 additional or portions of 14 additional banks to the east of the existing sanctuary. So in this map, the existing sanctuary, those indicated in red, like I mentioned before, the east and west Flower Garden Bank and Stetson Bank. And then to the east, you can see um, a number of areas indicated in white. And these are the proposed boundaries that we have suggested as being added to the Flower Garden Banks. And um, I'm gonna go into that expansion um, proposal in a bit of detail in a moment. Um, I, I'll also no note that um, 
these uh, these banks, m- many of them has have names that have, were given to them back in the 1970s and 1980s. And a lot of those names are essentially are, are people who were uh, first you know, discovered these areas and researched these areas in that time frame in the 1970s, 1980s. And many of those were um, scientists, professors from uh, Texas A&M. about banks and adding banks and flower garden banks. And then finally somebody said, well, what do you mean when you say bank? And um, so I, I forget sometimes that that's not a, a real common term um, for people. And so this is an underwater, um, a view of the, of the bottom in the vicinity of the flower garden banks. And so a bank is essentially any kind of feature that rises up around the, uh, the, the um, surrounding seafloor. In that um, map that I showed earlier, you know, the, um, the continental shelf, for the most part in the Gulf of Mexico, is quite flat. It's mostly um, soft sediment, mud and sand for the, uh, for the most part. But when you get to this area near the edge of the continental shelf, you have a number of these uh, features that protrude out of the surrounding seafloor, making these uh, features that we call banks. And banks is basically a, a maritime ter- a term for any kind of feature that rises up out of the bottom but is not um, uh, tall enough um, to be a hazard to navigation, uh, which is the official definition of a reef. A reef is uh, something that you can run aground, your boat aground on, where a bank is something that's a feature, but it's uh, relatively deep. And so when I talk about banks, that's what I'm talking about. It's just these, these underwater, they're almost like the mini mountains that come up out of the seafloor in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's actually very interesting the way these these uh, areas were formed. They're actually they're actually salt domes. You may have heard that term for other areas, but um, what it is is that there's a, a deep layer of um, underlying salt in um, in the Gulf of Mexico, shown by the purple um, uh, area this, in the um, in this diagram. This is if you were looking. Uh, from a side view of the um, uh, underneath the seafloor and those uh, areas at the very top is the seafloor. And so you have this underlying salt that's pushing up over time, pushing up these features and making um, uh, making this uh, topography on the seafloor in the areas that we know now as banks. And uh, you may be familiar with, um, with salt dome features. If you're, um, perhaps from this part of Texas. You may be familiar with the area known as High Island. Um, It's over on the Bolivar Peninsula. And on this map, you can see this circular feature. I have my cursor going around. I don't know if you see my cursor, but the thing labeled as High Island is a very distinctive circular feature. And that actually is also formed by a salt dome. It also happens to be a very uh, important in um, uh, bird rookery. And many people uh, go there. I think they're, uh, I think Rosie at Spoonbills and a number of other birds are nesting there right now. Um, but I digress. Um, what we have been doing at the Flower Garden Banks uh, for a number of years now is investigating these other uh, topographic features, these other banks. And we do this in a variety of ways. The first step is to map these features and you map them by, um, uh, by ship, of course, using uh, what's known as multi-beam bathymetry. It's just a really fancy depth finder that records um, uh, what the bottom features look like, and then you can pull it all together and make a, a very detailed map out of it. Uh, once you make that map, uh, you can then go and, and see what's down there. And we use, uh, because these areas are, are too deep, in most cases, to scuba dive, we use remotely operated vehicles, uh, sometimes submersibles and other um, uh, equipment to uh, to find out what it is on the bottom. And uh, some of these features are very complex. Uh, this is just happens to be one from Alderdice Bank, who um, is one of the areas that is being proposed for, um, for the expansion. And you can see those really tall peaks on the left-hand uh, portion of this feature. And um, those kinds of things, and this is uh, like um, like you see anywhere, really, when you have structure like that, especially if it's hard bottom structure 
around what is predominantly soft bottom, you get um, a lot of sea life attracted to it. And so on these rocky features have colonized a number of coral communities. And these are different than the corals that occur at the flower garden banks because the flower garden banks is shallow enough that um, true, what they call true coral reefs have developed. So these are the stony corals or the, the, the reef building corals. When you get deeper than that, deeper than about 50 meters or so, there's not enough light coming down into the seawater to, uh, to support true coral reef development. But you have a whole variety of other types of corals that colonize on rocky features as uh, seen in, this, uh, in some of these photographs. These are primarily what are known as black corals uh, or and octocorals. And, um, and so wherever you have rocky features, especially where the, you have um, organisms that have attached to the seafloor, you also attract um, all sorts of uh, fish and other marine animals. And so these are essentially biodiversity hotspots in the Gulf of Mexico because of those communities that have developed. And I'll just say that um, in this, um, uh, photograph or this uh, image, uh, kind of going from the upper right hand corner, you'll see uh, this is a photograph taken from Bright Bank, which is uh, quite near the flower garden banks. You can see that there's still a lot of light at this depth. Uh, so the, there's a lot of green in there because there's algae. And of course, algae needs light in order to grow. As you go down deeper, uh, down to the lower right, uh, an example from Geyer Bank, um, you kind of lose the, uh, the algae, but you see still some. Uh, types of coral that are growing there. You can. Um, this is uh, mostly fire coral uh, on that um, on that particular photograph. A lot of tropical fish. A lot of fish in general. On the upper left, you're getting deeper still, and that is primarily um, typified by uh, black coral communities and those um, uh, orange uh, things that look kind of like sea fans are actually black corals. And black corals are not always black. In fact, they're usually never black. They're named black corals because the skeleton underneath the living organism is black. And um, in the old days, that's the only way scientists uh, saw these things were in a, in a jar full of alcohol uh, and not live uh, like they are in this photograph. And then even deeper still in the lower left-hand corner, uh, you get to where the light is almost diminished to the point where there's very little light at all. And um, you get uh, a, a different type of community, but includes uh, a variety of, of of other types of black corals, um, types of solitary stony corals and sponges of various sorts. So these are um, very important communities, um, but uh, not well uh, not well known by by many people just because they're kind of one of those things that are out of sight, uh, out of mind. Hey, so GP. Oh, oh, sorry, you, go ahead. Could you give us the um, depths of each of these pictures? We had a question in the chat about it. What are the actual you're saying deeper and deeper, but what are the usual depths? Right. Okay. So I don't know the exact depth of these particular pictures, but in general, like the bright bank up in the upper right is probably about uh, 40 to four, uh, 40 meters or so, 120 feet, uh, 140 feet, something like that. Down to Geyer Bank, that's probably in the range of 150 to 200 feet. Alderdice Bank, Alderdice bank up in the upper left is uh, in the range of 300 to 350 feet and Elvers Bank in the lower left-hand corner is probably in the four to 500 foot depth range. So now I'm gonna go kind of in the history of what this expansion proposal actually is. Um, this all started um, every national marine sanctuary was required to have a management plan and we are required to review and revise our management plan as appropriate from time to time. Way back in 2007, we started a process to revise our management plan. And at that time, uh, one of the things that came out in the public uh, comment period and the interest in general was the fact that we should consider expansion, expanding the existing sanctuary to a larger area. And in fact, uh, in our management plan that we uh, published in 2012, it included a sanctuary expansion um, action plan. And we actually um, put in our management plan that we will go forward with a, um, to, to uh, assess the um, uh, 
the feasibility of expanding the sanctuary and, and coming up with a proposal for that. Um, we did do that. And in 2015, we published what was called a notice of intent. And, um, and that was an official notice to people that we are now um, initiating a, an official process to, to start that expansion. And um, as you can see, that was in uh, 2015. Um, so we did that. And uh, in 2016, in June of 2016, we released our um, proposal for expansion uh, and a draft environmental impact statement. And in that um, proposal, um, we uh, evaluated a number of potential alternatives for expansion. And it ranges, if I'm sure if you're familiar with federal actions, um, this, the, the typical way it's done is that the federal agency will propose something uh, in terms of a range of alternatives. And typically if they're uh, from a, um, it's usually called as a no action alternative, which is the status quo up to and including various levels of, um, uh, in this case, expansion. Um, so we did that and I, we had actually five alternatives. I'll show you the three, um, uh, three of them. And one of course is the no action alternative, which is the existing sanctuary. That's the East and West Flower Run Bank and Stetson Bank, as I uh, mentioned before. Um, we had a kind of the, a, a middle alternative, which, which was our alternative three and also identified as our preferred alternative, uh, which we, identified 15 additional banks um, in eight polygons. Some of the banks were uh, combined into single polygons and would um, expand the sanctuary from 56 square miles to 383 square miles. We also considered a even larger alternative um, that would look at a, big, at a broader geographic range. And this was our alternative five. And as you can see, not only did it include the reefs and banks um, of the Northwestern Gulf of Mexico that we've been speaking of until now. It also included a number of areas off uh, to the east, including areas east of the uh, Mississippi Delta. And that area, uh, some of those areas in that region are known as the Pinnacles off of Mississippi, Alabama. Very important uh, bank features of them in their own right, a very important fishing uh, lo locality. And we also included a number of um, spots that were uh, in deeper waters on the continental slope, off the continental shelf. GP, I'm going to interrupt you with a couple more questions. Sure. You talked to us about the depth. Can you tell us how high off the seafloor the banks are? Yeah, so that, arra that um, ranges. Um, and so the surrounding water depth in the area of um, where I was describing before uh, ranges from about 400 feet to about 600 feet. And then these features rise up um, to, uh, in, in some cases, like at the flower garden banks, they rise up within 60 feet of the sea, uh, of the sea surface. In other of the, of the areas, and which is more typical of the areas that we were looking at for expansion, they rise up within about um, 150 to 200 feet of the sea surface. So they, they have several hundred feet of elevation from the surrounding seafloor um, uh, in, in total. Excellent. And then we have two similar questions. You talked about some activities that are permitted and they're asking who regulates these activities. So the, um, the, the National Marine Sanctuary have regulations um, of our own that we have promulgated and we are proposing to promulgate or apply to these um, expanded areas. And those are the things like uh, the no anchoring that I mentioned, the uh, use and possession of certain fishing gear, discharges of pollutants and other um, material, that kind of thing. And we can enforce those directly. Uh, now we en enforce those primarily through the US Coast Guard and the NOAA Office of Law Enforcement. So we don't have our own enforcement arm at the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, uh, but these regulations can be enforced by any uh, designated law enforcement officer that has, you know, uh, uh, ability to enforce federal regulations. And some of the states uh, have those, uh, have that ability too. And both Texas and Louisiana have the ability to enforce 
uh, federal laws in the offshore areas, even outside of state waters. Um, now, a number of these other, you know, activities are also regulated by other federal agencies. Uh, of course, the, you know, the, the fishing regulations that are generated by the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council, of course, apply throughout the Gulf, including the, um, um, the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, unless there's more restrictive regulations uh, within the sanctuary. So things like bag limits, size limits, seasonal restrictions for certain species of fish, of course, those are all apply throughout this area. Uh, in terms of oil and gas um, development, primary agency that regulates oil and gas is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, it used to be known as the Minerals Management Service, and they have a variety of um, regulations that are designed to protect sensitive features, uh, that sort of thing. So there's a, um, there is a um, several, you know, um, layers of entities that regulate these types of activities in the Gulf of Mexico. that answer the answer to that question? Yes, thank you very much. We have a few more, but we'll let you continue. Okay. Um, so uh, we went through a public comment period at that uh, after the release of the draft environmental impact statement. And we uh, received quite a few comments. In fact, we see, received over 8,000 comments in various categories and um, we had what I feel is, you know, overwhelming support for um, sanctuary expansion in general. Um, and most people or very many people um, uh, express support for for the larger alternatives. Uh, I will note that in our draft EIS, um, we noted that that the larger alternatives were the most environmentally um, strongest and most beneficial alternatives. But the reason we went with the more moderate expansion uh, is it was essentially uh, based on the ability that that we felt that we had to manage these areas under the existing uh, framework existing budgets uh, ability of our staff and um, and infrastructure so um, so uh, that was that was the reason the main reason why we went with the um, a more moderate alternative as the preferred alternative there were some um, uh, opposition to the expansion. And uh, for the most part, that came from uh, the oil and gas uh, industry. And um, I'll get into that a, a little bit, a little bit more. But um, again, this is just a snapshot. Um, there's a lot, you know, um, uh, the, the public comment. And I also uh, will point out that it when when a federal agency takes public comment, it's just about not just about the numbers. Um, it's a uh, a variety of other factors go into how uh, an area, an, an alternative is evaluated besides just um, simply on the, the public input. So that kind of gets us where we are now. What we have done, you know, since the draft environmental impact statement in 2016, um, we have uh, taken the public comment. We have worked extensively with our sanctuary advisory council um, we have an uh, advisory council, as do all National Marine Sanctuaries, that are comprised of representatives of what we feel are the major constituent stakeholder groups uh, in this area. And, um, and so we went through a, a process with our advisory council to, uh, to evaluate uh, what we had proposed in our draft EIS, uh, taking the public comment into, into account, and what resulted was a, um, a modification of our preferred alternative, which I'll show you in one, in, in one second. So this is out on the street right now. It was published officially on May the 1st. Um, and that of course is published uh, in the federal register. And um, that's where the official proposal is. And it opened a public comment period that people can make comments on a website uh, called regulations.gov. That's the official portal for people to um, submit their comments and opinions on this proposal. We, um, uh, again, the, just the, in a snapshot, there are portions of 14 additional reefs and banks um, for a total of 160 square miles, which uh, represents a 104 square mile increase in size, and that we would apply the existing regulations in the from the flower run banks to these new areas. 
Um, we are taking public comments through July the 3rd, and we have scheduled three virtual public meetings because of the coronavirus issue. Uh, it was not advisable to have uh, in-person meetings. And so th these public meetings will be held virtually uh, via webinar. There are gonna be two of them on June the 8th, which is coming up soon, one in the afternoon and one in the evening, and then a follow-up evening public meeting on June the 11th. And um, I can certainly get that information to, uh, for anyone who is interested to log in uh, just to listen or to make public comment. And of course, you can always make public comments directly to uh, through the portal at um, regulations.gov, or you can do it the old fashioned way and, and write a letter and send it to, uh, address it to me at the Flower Run Banks National Marine Sanctuary. And all that information is in um, the uh, Federal Register notice. It's on our website and, um, and, and other venues. One thing I'll, I'll point out that in this proposed rule, uh, we are asking for additional input on um, three areas. First is um, the boundary configurations that we have come up with. And um, that's because they have changed since the uh, preferred alternative that we published in 2016. And then we've got two comments that came through various sources that we, um, uh, we, we would like additional comments on. One is from um, the highly migratory species uh, uh, fishery regulation entity for NOAA to exempt the possession of pelagic longline gear in the uh, in these expanded areas and there's also been a um, proposal both by the gulf of mexico fishery management council and our advisory council to provide an exemption for spearfishing gear in the expanded sanctuary i'll just note that we are asking uh, for specific input on that although people can um, comment on any aspect of the expansion proposal during this period um, I'll just note on our website, um, you can get, there's a lot of information there. You can get a copy of the Federal Register Notice, which is uh, just a screenshot for what a Federal Register Notice looks like on the left. Uh, we have you know, a variety of fact sheets and information um, uh, as, as noted on the fact sheet on the, on the right-hand side of this slide. We have um, created a document that has taken each of those 14 additional features and put them in a, um, in a document that provides um, uh, some specific information about each of those bank features, where the proposed boundaries are being proposed, uh, and what some of the typical biological communities that are associated uh, with those bank features that you can um, take a look at and get a better idea of what kind of um, biological communities are involved in this expansion proposal. So. Um, this is what the changes look like. Um, the areas that are noted in purple are the boundaries that were proposed in the 2016 um, uh, preferred alternative in the draft environmental impact statement. And the white areas, areas designated in white, are what is being proposed now in this notice of proposed rulemaking. And you can see that um, those areas in, in most cases have been reduced in size. And um, the primary reason for that is the uh, input and interaction that we had with both the commercial fishing um, interests and um, oil and gas in interests. Um, I'll show you a graphic in a minute of the amount of oil and gas activity there is in this area, but I'm sure everyone is familiar that this is one of the most highly developed uh, areas for exploration and recovery of offshore oil and gas resources in the world. And there are literally thousands of oil and gas platforms in this part of the Gulf of Mexico and thousands of miles of pipelines. And um, uh, we went to great effort to try to minimize the impact of the oil and gas industry um, in this proposal. And uh, as always, that's a, there are compromises there. Um, oh, that's the same map, except with the, um, uh, so there is a reduction uh, from 383 square miles that we proposed in 2016 to 160 square miles uh, in this notice of proposed rulemaking. 
Um, the, uh, these areas, as I mentioned, are very sensitive to, um, uh, to a variety of impacts. I want to kind of just generally go over those types of impacts um, right now. The, you know, you know, one thing is that uh, uh, there is evidence of, uh, of the offshore industry in, the, uh, in this vicinity. Um, you can see there's, you know, just a discarded barrel, some other kind of debris. Uh, there's a, a cable in the lower left that we believe is, a, uh, is an old seismic cable. Uh, this, these are pictures are taken from um, McGrail Bank. There's still evidence of some recent anchoring. As you can see, there's actually a submersible uh, making surveys in the upper right. These areas are right off of a major shipping lane in this part of the Gulf of Mexico, and you can imagine the amount of traffic uh, of large ships uh, going in and out of the port of uh, New Orleans, um, uh, back and forth from Mexico into the Caribbean. Um, uh, anchoring is a, a, a huge concern. Uh, these pictures are, are actually uh, taken from the dry tortugas, um, but it, those types of ships are the same kinds of ships that are, are plying the waters right off of these areas in the Gulf of Mexico. And that um, picture shows you the size of an anchor for, uh, for a ship of this size, which is about of a thousand foot ship, which is very typical in the, um, uh, in the shipping industry. Uh, and you can imagine the damage that, that anchoring can do for um, in just a few moments uh, in these kinds of sensitive communities. And uh, this just shows a, 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 an incidence of anchoring at Geyer Bank. This is one of the areas that are being proposed uh, of a ship being um, uh, anchored there uh, at that time, you know, th that's one of the things that we feel is important as a as a national sanctuary program. Like I mentioned, there's several other entities that regulate certain activities, but there's other things that um, fall through the cracks. For example, in this area is actually considered as a habitat area of particular concern by the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council. Uh, and so fishing vessels are not allowed to anchor there. It's also has been identified as a no activity zone by the um, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, and so oil and gas vessels can, cannot disturb the seafloor or anchor there. But yet there's no regulation that prevents a freighter uh, like this ship in this photograph to anchor in this um, in this location. So we feel that the National Marine Sanctuary Program would bring a comprehensive management regime to these areas that can address all types of uh, impacts, not just specific ones. Um, we do see some uh, impacts of fishing gear uh, throughout these areas. Um, uh, up in the upper left-hand corner at Stetson Banks, it's still some remnants of old uh, shrimp nets there. Uh, we do see bottom long lines, uh, anchor lines, um, that kind of thing. And this, of course, is what um, one of the things that we would want to prevent by establishing these areas as a national marine sanctuary. Um, as you can see, I mean, these areas are are prime uh, areas for uh, fish species in their various life stages. This is where they go to spawn many species um, and where they, they settle out as young juveniles and grow up. And um, many of these species are of extreme importance for the commercial and recreational fishery in the Gulf of Mexico. So not only is there a biological importance to these protecting these areas, but there is a economic uh, importance to them as well. I mentioned uh, oil and gas activity. Um, this is just a graphic of the, um, of the number of uh, oil platforms in the Gulf of Mexico, in the northern Gulf of Mexico. They're actually, um, uh, a lot of them are being removed at this time. There, um, there was up to around 3,000 oil and gas platforms just a few years ago, and um, a number of them are, uh, have been, um, been removed as they and come to the end of their um, useful life. Uh, but there's still uh, uh, close to 2,000 or so uh, oil and gas platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. And on this graphic, I also showed where the, um, uh, the Deepwater Horizon incident happened. It was off the coast of, uh, of, of Louisiana, Mississippi. And as you can see, it was quite a ways away from the flower garden banks, which are the two red circles and the sort of the extreme left-hand side of this map. 
And so uh, luckily we did not see any direct, um, direct physical impact from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, but as time goes on, uh, as you probably know, there has been a lot of less subtle uh, or more, more subtle impacts that are being discovered as time goes on. And there was, um, uh, there is still some um, concern that some of these areas um, have been impacted by that, by that oil spill. We actually had two questions about oil fields and um, the sanctuary. One is how close are oil fields? And the second one is, was there any thought about including those Deepwater Horizon disaster areas in the protected areas to help them recover? Yes. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have a map showing a zoom in uh, around the flower garden banks, for example, to show locations of the um, uh, the existing infrastructure for oil and gas activity. But they are all around um, most of these features that are being proposed uh, for expansion. In fact, there was a um, an oil platform, an operating oil platform that was incorporated inside the boundary of the East Flower Garden Bank when it was designated as, in 1992. Uh, our regulations actually allow for uh, certain types of oil and gas exploration in the sanctuary as long as they're uh, outside of the, the previously designated no activity zones and comply with other um, pretty stringent uh, regulations. Um, and so that, that particular platform was less than a mile from the um, from the East Flower Garden Bank. There are approximately within a 10 mile radius of the flower garden banks. I know that there are probably on the order of 15 to 20 um, uh, oil and gas platforms. And as far as the terms of the um, of the reserves of the actual oil fields, um, those are relatively well mapped for this part of the Gulf of Mexico and they are um, uh, they occur throughout this whole region. The other thing that I um, uh, should mention about salt domes is that salt domes are also um, prime areas where people look for oil and gas because um, oil and gas hydrocarbons tend to accumulate uh, in these salt dome areas because they are trapped there by the by the um, by the thick layers of salt, and so um, many of these areas that are uh, important because they're uh, biologically sensitive are also prime loco locations for oil and gas resources and therefore that's that's the reason why we had uh, such quite uh, extensive discussions related to that um oh and i'm sorry what was the second qu question the second question was was there any thought of um oh, oh, right. the water horizon area yes in fact that um alternative five that i mentioned uh, when I showed you the range of alternatives in 2016, actually included the 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 physical um, uh, remnants of the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig as incorporated into the uh, into the National Marine Sanctuary. It, that was a little bit controversial, actually. Uh, we included in that alternative five um, uh, a number of uh, what's known as submerged cultural resources, shipwrecks, primarily. Uh, there are a lot of really important um, shipwrecks in the Gulf of Mexico, ranging back to the, um, the very early days of exploration of this continent. And um, we included, um, I think, seven or eight of those in the proposal for Alternative 5. We also included the actual the wreck of the uh, Deepwater Horizon r drilling rig um, because it was, uh, an, it was a spill of national significance. It was a, um, a memorial, actually, for the people who lost their lives during that um, uh, during that incident, and so so the answer is yes, we did include that 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 physical location of the Deepwater Horizon in that alternative uh, for expansion. And, and speaking of that, I just wanted to uh, kind of probably familiar with this. This was the uh, a map of the um, surface location of oil after you know from the deep water horizon and obviously it's it's concentrated around the actual uh impact site um but it did spread out in, for a wide range on the um on the sea surface in this uh, portion of the gulf of mexico 
but as I mentioned again, um, wh where where we are, the flower garden banks and the sort of the left hand side of this map, uh, we were um, fortunately outside of the range of the direct impacts of that of that surface oil. Um, but because of the dispersions that were used in the Deepwater Horizon incident, there was a deep water plume that actually tracked uh, sort of to the south and west. And so some of these areas on the continental slope were actually impacted by the um, by the oil spill, not from direct um, surface uh, release, but from the um, dispersant release that accumulated uh, and traveled in deep water currents uh, to the west. And I think um, I just want to I, I want to stop it there because I know we're kind of running short um, on time, um, but I. Uh, there is so much more I could have talked about, but I, I, I tried to pick out uh, a, a range of, of issues that you may, may be interested in. Uh, I encourage you to go uh, on our website, um, flowergarden.noaa.gov, and um, we have a, a, a whole section on the expansion. It includes a lot of background information. It includes uh, photographs and some video uh, of these areas. Also, uh, there is a, a, a map feature on it. It's a uh, geographic information system based kind of map. So you can actually uh, go into there and uh, scroll around, zoom in on particular bank features. Uh, and there are different layers that you can actually turn on the um, uh, the existing oil and gas infrastructure, for example, where the shipping lanes are. Uh, we even have information about what some of the biological communities is and are and the um, uh, extent of the density of biological organisms and that kind of thing. And so it's a it's kind of fun to play around with if you're familiar with uh, kind of the Esri uh, GIS uh, mapping uh, tools, you'd be very comfortable in, in um, maneuvering around in that uh, in that map feature. So I encourage you to take a look at that as well. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's what I have. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to talk to you today. And um, you can certainly uh, follow up with me directly, um, you know, through Anna and, and Joni, or you, uh, you can find me, you know, on the on our website, um, um, find one of us, uh, the staff on our website, and um, and direct any questions or concerns that you have to us, and also in, uh, encourage you to uh, comment on the proposal. And like I say, it's um, that public comment period is open through July the third. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, GP. So we're gonna do a few more questions. Yes, we have some really good questions from the audience. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, it's so cool to see all the pictures, see how beautiful it is, and also hear about um, the ways in which the sanctuary is protecting all of this, these cool habitats um, in the Gulf. Um, so one of the questions uh, is climate change and ocean acidification having a large impact on these areas? Short answer is yes. Um, and that is probably the, an overriding issue. Uh, of course, it, that applies everywhere in the world right now. Uh, and the Gulf of Mexico is not immune to that. Uh, you may have actually even seen some um, news stories that right now, this year, the, the waters of the Gulf of Mexico are as warm as they've ever been for this time of year. And um, it's typically kind of uh, discussed in the, in the terms of because, and that might spawn, you know, more hurricane activity and that kind of thing. Um, but it's also really bad news for coral reefs and other kinds of organisms. Um, there's a phenomenon known as coral bleaching that I'm sure you've heard about. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef uh, over the last, just in recent years, has had a series of back-to-back -back coral bleaching events that have killed um, a high percentage of living coral on the, on, the, on the biggest coral reef in the world. And coral bleaching is directly caused by sea, seawater temperature rise. And seawater temperature rise is absolutely associated with uh, climate change. Uh, we have seen some bleaching at the flower garden banks. Uh, we had a fairly um, a serious one in 2016. Luckily, um, again, because our, our reefs are a little bit deeper and, and farther offshore, um, and they, that seems to happen later in the, in the year than other places in the Caribbean, and so the water cooled off quickly enough, so there was not a lot of mortality. 
Um, but really, as a as a as a manager of a coral reef kind of area, climate change is the biggest concern that that we have. You know, the the question of what can we do about it as a national as a sanctuary that's a little less clear. Uh, we certainly can't pass a regulation, you know, that only applies to a very small area in the Gulf. It's a, such a bigger issue, but um, it is incumbent upon us, I think, to at least at a minimum to raise awareness to this issue and uh, and to follow the science. We have um, uh, we have temperature um, uh, we have thermometers, you know, measuring the temperature of the water at the reef at reef bank um, and that have been in place since the uh, so actually since the late 1980s. We have a very good record. And there is absolutely a significant increase in um, seawater, the rise of seawater temperature over that period. So, um, yes. So, PP, to follow up on that, your existing management plan, one of the questions is, will it apply to the expansion area or will you come up with a new management plan? The management plan will, uh, will generally apply to the new areas. Um, the first thing we have to do after the, the expansion happens is to revise our management plan to address some specific issues that will um, uh, will arise based on individual areas in the expansion area. Um, but in general, um, the uh, the management approaches that we take for the existing sanctuary are also applicable to these expanded areas. And so the regulations I already sort of talked about, but the other types of things like, for example, uh, at the flower garden banks, because we have an anchoring uh, prohibition, we have installed mooring buoys out there. So um, that will allow people to tie up to the mooring buoy so they don't have to anchor. And it still um, uh, allows access of those areas for recreational purposes, which we uh, want. Um, and so there are a certain number of the banks that are being proposed for expansion that will also be, um, uh, we intend to, to um, install and maintain mooring buoys at those locations. Uh, certainly the types of educational programs and other things that we uh, uh, applicable to those uh, expanded areas. So um, the general management plan will apply immediately when upon expansion, but we will be revising our management plan to to address specific issues that that come up related to that. And will that include thinking about new endangered and threatened species that maybe are in areas that are not currently in the sanctuary, but um, are going to be in the sanctuary after it's expanded or would be in if it was expanded? That's a very interesting question. Um, there, Cause there's uh, certain different levels of um, species that have been identified already as threatened and endangered. For example, uh, there are, uh, we have several species of stony corals that have uh, recently been designated as threatened um, these are species of star coral that um, that occur at the East and West Flower Garden Bank, also occur at, at certain other um, banks in this expansion area. Um, there's not a whole lot of um, endangered species that have been designated in terms of coral, although I would argue that there, there needs to be. Um, there's more uh, air, uh, animals that have been identified as threatened and endangered species that are the more kind of mobile um, pelagic animals. So sea turtles, of course, you know, are um, are important. They're threatened and endangered. Um, we have shown at the flower garden banks that these are critical areas for uh, loggerhead sea turtles, probably for hawksbill sea turtles as well, as um, as primary you know sites, foraging sites for the subadult um, uh, level of of loggerhead sea turtles. There were some sea turtles that were tagged you know, and followed over a course of a couple of years. And those sea turtles, which are not quite large enough uh, to reproduce yet, but they're still fair sized turtles, um, basically stayed at the flower garden banks for that period. They would range out, you know, for tens or of kilometers, but they would always return, you know, and that's where they were hanging out. In fact, the, the people that were doing the study, um, those turtles were, you could go to this, this ledge, you know, where this, they, were, they were first found and tagged and they would come back to that same ledge and hang out there. So these are, you know, they're, um, they're utilizing these areas um, extensively. Just recently, uh, the giant manta ray has been shown that um, studies that, that, of course they roam all over the Gulf of Mexico, but the, the ones that we see at the flower garden banks are always really small. Manta rays can be huge, you know, and so, but the ones that we see are relatively small. And it was, um, 
And that's because these are juveniles or in some cases are all their babies. And so it's at least been, it's been proposed, I've uh, been totally nailed down yet, but it's proposed that these are nursery areas for, for manta rays, which are in our threatened species. Um, and that, you know, and so the same thing goes for other, you know, wide ranging animals like whale sharks and, and other types of, uh, of animals. And so, you know, because we've taken this approach that there, there are small areas that are separated by, um, by open ocean, obviously, you know, to protect a species that's ranging throughout that range, um, you're not going to protect them just by designating small areas, but we hope that it will at least um, help in that regard. And certainly areas like the example I gave for loggerhead sea turtles, which are a critical area for a certain life, part of their life history is, um, you know, will provide protection, to, you know, at least at those critical times of their, uh, of their lives. So, um, uh, so yes, it's a mix of things, you know, um, but we believe that marine protected areas like the National Marine Sanctuary Program can add to the protection of um, uh, threatened and endangered species and, and marine mammals. We don't get that many marine mammals, actually. It's interesting. Um, uh, it's it's kind of rare to see uh, dolphins that far offshore, um, but, uh, but we have occasional uh, visits by other types of uh, marine mammals as well. GP, as you expand the sanctuary, it will continue to be called the Flower Garden Banks? The um, proposal as it stands right now, it, yes, it would be. That's something that uh, didn't really come up, um, uh, but you could certainly argue that maybe uh, maybe we should consider a, a different name or a more expansive name. Um, uh, but that was, it was kind of curious that it, that really didn't come up as, a, as an issue. Um, uh, but you may, uh, certain other expansions that have happened in the sanctuary program have come along with a, with a name change. And so we're, we'd be open to that. But right now, it, the proposal is just to keep it as the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Excellent. And are there any satellites that are used in these restricted areas for um, protection to monitor vessel anchoring or any other activities? Not that are designated solely for that purpose. Uh, however, it's really interesting because, um, as you know, being on the advisory council, Joni, that, you know, we have very little data on certain types of activities. Um, and it's very difficult to, um, to know how many vessels are out there and what, and what activities are, um, are involved with. Um, but in recent years, you know, there are a lot of commercial satellites that are out there that we can um, tap into. And we actually have um, a project right now working with another uh, part of NOAA that's that's working with a, a, a company that that provides satellite imagery you know from not only on land but on the ocean and we are hoping that we'll at least be able to get some um, information uh, related to the number of vessels in the area and that kind of thing through um, uh, through that information you know there are many vessels now the, the commercial fishing vessels for example use known as a vessel monitoring system, VMS, uh, that they're required to have on their um, boats. And we can get that information through the National Marine Fisheries Service. And then large vessels like, you know, shipping um, ships and, and most other types of commercial vessels have AI, what's known as AIS. And that is something that we can also um, uh, tap into, to, uh, which is a, basically a satellite-based, you know, communication system to track uh, vessel traffic throughout the world. Um, and so we can get information from that too. So there's a variety of different sources um, that does involve satellite uh, satellite communications to, uh, and which is improving our ability to um, to monitor and manage these areas. Very cool. So I think as maybe a good final question to wrap up our webinar today, um, who gives the final okay to expand and um, you know, what recommendations would you give people as they're kind of thinking about what kinds of comments they want to submit um, in this public comment period? The way the process is set up in the under the National Marine Sanctuaries Act is actually a um, uh, it's something that's known can be it can be administratively designated. So in other words, it doesn't need congressional. Um, it doesn't have to be congressionally designated. Um, and it's basically the. Um, the responsibility of the Secretary of Commerce, Department of Commerce, because as I mentioned before, NOAA is in this in the Department of Commerce, um, who makes essentially the final decision. 
uh, about expansion. Uh, as you can imagine, um, there are a lot of entities that um, uh, weigh in on this on this process, and certainly Congress does have a role. Um, and there is a provision in our act that if um, if a uh, that we you know have to advise you know the um, the uh, appropriate committees in the um, both on the House and the Senate side, and if they have um, if there's concern, uh, then they can um, raise that concern, and it has to be addressed specifically. And so, um, so while Congress doesn't have to specifically approve the sanctuary, they can um, they can make it either um, easy or hard, depending on uh, uh, on the, what they're hearing from their constituents. So, um, so you know, the simple answer is that um, this can be this can be designated by the Secretary of Commerce. And um, as far as um, uh, as comments, you know, I think um, I, I would just say, you know, um, that um, there's been a you know long process to getting where we are. Um, that that um, Opinion, you know, opinions showing, you know, support for the general idea um, are certainly welcome because that's we uh, we we hope that we you know have uh, proposed something that is um, that that is will result in a in a good thing. Um, I understand, you know, from I think most people on this call are on the environmental side, you know, and um, that uh, and I as an environmentalist myself would have liked to seen it bigger, uh, um, but uh, and. While well, those comments are are certainly welcome as uh, too, um, I, I will point out that this uh, the proposal that we have on the on the on the books or out for review right now, I think does um, uh, does or is a, is a a very strong achievement and something that can be based on for for future action and um, uh, if we if we can. Thank so you so I, much. I just. Um, any kind of comments as well are welcome. And, mm -hmm. I, and I, I think it's really important for people to become engaged on it. And uh, it shows the level of interest, you know, and it, it gives more support for our program in general, uh, I think, because I think people are truly um, uh, supportive of the idea of marine protected areas and um, that we need to do more to protect our oceans. Um, and, marine Absolutely. Areas. and we have several questions that we weren't able to get to. So I just want to remind everybody that the website that you see, um, if you haven't checked it out, please do go to it. GP mentioned there's an amazing amount of information about the expansion. There's questions about the different sizes, the different um, proposals, the different alternatives and how they compare to this current proposal that's out there for expansion. And all that information is available. And then some of the interactive map features, you can look at coral density, you can look at shipping lanes, you can look at oil activity. And so it's a really amazing resource. And so I wanted to apologize to everybody that had additional questions that we just don't have time to get to today. But as GP said um, in one of his slides, this expansion has had tremendous support, um, even for the largest per uh, alternative five. So please, if you participated, um, go out there, explore a little bit on their website, and then do enter comments. Um, it will go through July 3rd, correct, GP? Yes, that is correct. Okay, awesome. And I just want to mention as well, we had one comment that, you know, a lot of people have no idea these coral banks exist, and they're so cool. I mean, if, if you learned anything from this, I hope that you took away how cool these ecosystems are and how beautiful they are, and so share it with people. Tell people about how beautiful these places are, how they need protection, um, and that uh, the National Marine Sanctuary is a really good way to protect them. Absolutely. And there's questions. We are recording this, and Anna and Environmental Texas and Turtle Island Restoration Network will both have the link available so that you can share with others and refer back to it for any information or any additional questions. So, GP, I wanted to thank you again. You do an amazing job, you and your staff, with the research you do and the protection that you offer for these beautiful banks out in the Gulf of Mexico. And thank you for your time today. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I'll take care. All right. You too. Everybody have a great day. Thank you so much.